Welcome to another presentation from the CV Academics Foundation, home of the AMP Honors Program. Hi, AMP Honors Program. I'm here today with Tom Davey, who is a PA hyphen C, as he just described to me. It's a physician, a certified physician assistant who works primarily in the emergency department, um, as well as urgent care, and he's been a hospitalist as well. Um, thanks for thanks for talking with me today, Tom. Thanks for having me. And uh, I want to. So you went to UWL for your PA, correct? Yes, that's true. Okay, and is that where you went undergrad too, or no? No, I went to undergraduate in Bemidji State University. Oh. Uh, did a major in bio uh, with a minor in biochem. Solid. And where are you from originally? Are you from like Minnesota or? Yeah, northern Minnesota, small town, and yeah. <laughs> it's cold. It gets cold. Up it's there. very cold. <laughs> it's an hour south of the coldest part of the uh, lower 48. Wow. So can you start off just kind of describing what a physician assistant is? Sure. So uh, physician assistants uh, started, I don't have the exact year, but it's in like the 1960 time frame. Uh, Eugene Stead uh, was one of the first physicians to champion uh, the training of PAs. And uh, if I'm getting my history correct, uh, there was a large number of very well-trained, highly skilled uh, medics from the war uh, that came back. And they ended up uh, finding a good spot to be able to practice working mainly with orthopedic surgeons. Um, and eventually that worked so well that they decided to train additional uh, folks to do that work. So it did kind of have its inception um, through these highly skilled medics and then uh, mainly surgical specialties. Uh, but then it was formalized and PA schools have um, progressively expanded um, over the last several decades. Um, so that's kind of how the physician assistants got their start. That's cool. I didn't, I didn't know any of that. So that's, that's cool to learn. Um, so uh, how did you, so this is kind of a three-parter. Um, take it however you want, but how did you become interested in medicine first and then like physician assistant specifically, and then even more specifically emergency and urgent care? Sure, those are great questions, pretty broad. <laughs> uh, so I would say that I had a very difficult time in high school and in college narrowing down my interests. Uh, I have quite a few of them. I knew I didn't want to be an English major uh, but other than that, everything seemed like it was on the table. Uh, as I started to go through my undergrad, I took, you know, calc-based physics and biochem and uh, biology classes. And those seemed to be the ones that I enjoyed the most. Although I also, I mean, I'm a big nerd, so I really like multivariable calculus too. So for a while, I actually thought I wanted to be a math professor. Um, over time though, knowing that I liked so many subjects, medicine, medicine started to become interesting to me because you were able to use all of those fields. So you wouldn't get pigeonholed into just doing physics um, or just math. You can actually use all of those disciplines. And then not only can you use them, but you can use them towards uh, helping other folks uh, that may not be healthy um, or maintain their health. So that's what kind of got me interested in medicine. So then I started to explore all the different fields of medicine. I was a phlebotomist uh, in undergrad, would get up at 4.30 in the morning, go draw 35 people's blood in a nursing home, in a hospital, drop them off, then I'd go to my microbiology class and sometimes fall asleep. But uh, no, it was, it was a good way to kind of just rub shoulders with lab technologists, we were right next door to a pathologist and I'd go into their office and, you know, bug him to let me look at slides under the microscope and run over on parasites. And I, the lab techs would let me plate a lot of their specimens. So it was really fun to do that. Yeah. Um, and I got to see what nurses and doctors and nurse practitioners and physician assistants did. Um, so I did think that I had it narrowed down to either becoming a physician um, or a PA at the end of my undergrad. And I took the MCAT and I took the GRE, um, but I just didn't feel like fully committed at that point. I kind of, I kind of balked a little bit at like knowing what I wanted to do yet. So I, I actually didn't 
go for either of those and became a uh, initially a virology uh, technologist mm -hmm. as well as a micro technologist at a uh, testing company. Uh, so like we, we did like Western blots and dark field microscopy and all this stuff on these different donor samples so people could get their cornea and not get a infectious disease when mm -hmm. they get it. Um, and so that time for the next three years in Minneapolis, I, I shadowed PAs, I shadowed nurse practitioners, I shadowed physicians, I even shadowed my cousin who's a physical therapist. Um, and over that amount of time, over those three years, while I was progressively changing jobs because I get bored easily, I, uh, I kind of found that PA might be the best fit for me because I realized that the thing about myself was that I didn't want to be stuck in a specialty. Mm. And I didn't have one area of interest um, in any area of my life. I always like trying new things. And so I was worried that if I became a physician, the first field that I jumped into in 10 years, I may not enjoy pediatric endocrinology. Right. And then I'd become a little bit disgruntled. And so <laughs> physician assistant seemed to be a really good fit for that because the training is intense, but it doesn't put you into one category. Mm -hmm. um, you get out with this generalist training. Um, a lot of your training is on the job. And if you really don't like being an orthopedic surgery PA, uh, after four years, if you're dedicated, you can make a switch. So you could become a family practice PA. You could end up switching over and doing what I do in the urgent care and emergency medicine. So Knowing that, that's when I applied. Um, my you know, GRE scores were still good from my undergrad. I hadn't waited too long. And uh, so I was able to apply and be very specific about the programs I wanted to apply to. Um, luckily, I was able to uh, be accepted, uh, matriculated into UWL's PA program, which was kind of one of those top 10 ones that I really wanted to get into. Um, reciprocity for tuition didn't hurt at all either <laughs> uh and went to pa school and then i think the third part of your question was once i graduated how did i choose eventually urgent care and emergency medicine and so you know it really reaffirmed being a pa because as soon as i got out of school i thought i really need to learn more you know two years is aggressive and a lot of learning but it's still just scratching the surface. And so uh, getting a job with a hospitalist team that I knew um, had residents uh, that were working uh, in different teams where I was at uh, allowed a lot of teaching to happen. So there'd be hematologists and rheumatologists and nephrologists that would be giving like whiteboard talks while I was you know, working on the floor. So I'd get to jump in on that training. I, I kind of almost like got a residency in, in a way, like I got to sit with the residents and learn stuff. And so it was just a really nice way to solidify the knowledge I had already gained and then expand upon that. Uh, after five or six years of internal medicine, I felt like I had really felt pretty confident in a lot of those general skills and, and uh, knowledge and thinking through differentials and such, but I missed procedures. I missed suturing. I missed setting, you know, setting fractures and reducing dislocations. And, and I, at least for me, the sweet spot seemed to be in a little bit more of an acute care setting. Mm -hmm. um, I, I didn't mind and I was good at tweaking things of hospitalized patients, you know, adjusting Lasix drips and, you know, calculating FENA scores and uh, all of that fun stuff. But part of me just liked, and maybe this is kind of the superficial part of me, is I like a quick hit. Like I like okay. to have a nursemaid's elbow come in and in five minutes, the kid's like raising their arm and they're feeling great. The parents are happy and they leave and you feel like you really did something positive for them. Um, so that's kind of what started getting me interested in urgent care. Luckily, there was a position and I popped over into that. I worked my way into the ER by pushing and bullying my way in. Uh, the physicians were not used to working with PAs in the ER. 
Um, and so they were a little bit, you know, concerned about how that would work. Um, but luckily I won them over through time and effort and uh, gained their trust. And, and now we have from me of one, I think now we have 11 PAs and nurse practitioners that work both the um, urgent care and some of them do work in the ER proper. Mm -hmm. And is that, is that what I was, what I was seeing when I was scribing there? I remember, I think when I started scribing, there weren't, there weren't many PAs or nurse practitioners in the emergency room. And then they opened up like the pod D. Was that, was that the transition or was that happening before? Uh, yeah, that was actually during part of the transition. So mm. pod D opening up was uh, another way to get PAs and nurse practitioners to be able to work in the emergency department. And it worked out really well because, you know, as a, you know, I'll kind of separate out nurse practitioners and PAs just because um, there is a, some subtle differences in the way yep. that we work with physicians. But um, as a physician assistant, they always, since the inception has been that you work with a supervising physician or um, a physician that kind of leads that team. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's really nice to have docs in the ED, board certified ER docs, they're always on. And then if you have any questions or you want to do a procedure together, they're always there to kind of to be um, your liaison and help you through patient cases. Um, obviously, as you become more mature and you gain the trust of those physicians, the oversight becomes less and less. Mm -hmm. um, but it's nice. To, I like the idea of a team approach. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and I, I noticed like your, your multiple interests and you're kind of getting bored easily as you were saying, that's kind of trickled into your, your like specialty, um, especially, I mean, I know a little bit from experience, I guess, with emergency medicine, it's like no, no two days are the same and you see so many different things. Um, it's kind of hard to get bored, I guess. <clears throat> so you're kind of fighting that, fighting that urge. Um, so with emergency and urgent care, can you go into a little bit more about what it entails and maybe describe like a day in the life? Sure, yeah. Uh... It's shift work. Uh, so unlike the hospital where you carry a pager and you might get called uh, late at night, I don't carry a pager, I carry a mobile Cisco phone. Mm -hmm. um, and many ERs and urgent cares around the country work 10s or 12s. It's pretty rare to have the eights that our group does. So you do work more days, but the idea was to prevent burnout. So you don't feel like you're just kind of dragging that third 12 in a row. Yeah. Uh, so. Basically, I come into work, um, grab my phone, and work my shift. Sometimes I start at 6 a.m. Sometimes I start at 7 p.m. and get done at 3 a.m. in the morning. Um, most of the time, it's usually eight or nine hours uh, that I work because you have to clean up afterwards. Um, so it is a very sustainable time frame. Mm -hmm. And when you pop into work, you basically just sign in. You look at the track board, and every red uh, mark where the patient is listed next to it means that that's a patient waiting to be seen uh, that doesn't have a clinician assigned to them yet. And so I just sign up as soon as I have a free moment, I sign up for the next patient and look up their uh, presenting complaint, their initial vitals. I see if they came by ambulance or if they were brought in by a family member. I might take a 30 second peruse through the chart just to see what some of their medical history is. Mm -hmm. And then I go in and, and do an intake where I interview them and do my initial physical exam and get my initial orders. And so it's very dynamic and, and really a lot of multitasking. Um, you end up managing, you know, anywhere between four and eight patients at a time usually. And so you're kind of juggling priorities on a constant basis. You, you get called away, interrupted all the time. Uh, you get phone calls um, from other consulting physicians and surgeons in the hospital. Um, maybe the nurse comes up to you and says that roommate's blood pressure is tanked and you have to go, you know, address that right away. Um, there might be students, um, both medical students, residents, fellows in the department that you get to teach, which I love doing. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a whirlwind. And then at the end of the day, you feel exhausted, but you feel like you did something positive for a lot of folks. Um, and you also feel like the time flew by. You really don't ever feel like, oh, I'm looking at the clock a lot. It, it always flies by for me, which is a good thing. 
Yeah, yeah, for sure. And the the multitasking thing, I can definitely attest to as well. I, in my time in scribing, it and I like as a scribe, I I had multitasking too, but not to the level or extent that you guys do. Um, you made it sound so simple. I feel like it's not as simple as you make it sound. Um, so so what? Well, before I get to that, what um, you mentioned like suturing and procedures um, in that aspect. How like what percentage maybe of your patient population? do you find yourself doing procedures on? That's a good question. Uh, I've never looked at the data, so I would have to just venture a guess, but I would say that there's a procedure in about 10%, maybe okay. 20% of ER patients, and that's higher in urgent care patients. Mm. Um, I would say it's more like 20 to 40%. You end up having simple lacerations far more commonly than a chainsaw laceration. And so in the urgent care, suturing, abscess drainage, simple fracture reductions, splinting, um, you know, skin scraping even, um, mm -hmm. biopsies, uh, dental blocks. Those are very common in the urgent care. Um, in emergency department, there is more of your um, chronically ill medical patient um, that you may or may not need to admit to the hospital. And it's a, you do get traumas and such, but mm -hmm. those are a little less common. Thankfully. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. And sometimes the trauma team comes out and takes care of that too, which is exactly a little less stress on you. Okay. So could you tell me maybe what types of careers are available for physician assistants? Is it the whole wide range or maybe there's specific ones that are more common? Yeah, I mean, it's really a fairly expansive uh, career path. Um, and really, you know, the sky's the limit. I would say that the top few are still like orthopedics. Mm -hmm. Emergency medicine has expanded a lot in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, family practice, there's a huge need there as they've always struggled to find enough physicians to fill those roles, at least in the last couple decades, um, especially in rural America. So um, PAs, nurse practitioners are filling some of those uh, roles that otherwise would be vacant, um, which is a, a nice spot for the career to move. Um, there isn't as much in research, although there is, there are, there are a few openings in that, but, um, that would be one of the areas that I'd say that is an area of growth for PAs. Um, academia, um, is an area that you can go into as well, um, mainly in PA schools, of course. Um, and then internationally, there are a few. Um, PA programs that are starting to kind of ramp up. So in Canada, um, New Zealand had, doesn't have programs, but you can practice there. Mm -hmm. uh, the UK, uh, Scotland, and a few others. Wow, cool. And so you mentioned uh, your your role as like a teacher um, with students and residents and that kind of thing. Um, is being at an academic hospital something that you prioritized or that you wanted to be a part of? Yeah, I mean, Initially, I wanted to be there because I needed to learn. Uh, but now, and I always need to learn, I'm, a, I'm learning every day. In fact, I learn more from the students than they may learn from me some days, I think. Um, but yes, uh, it's been a great opportunity. I, I started, I think about two years ago now, um, working with uh, Dr. Zimmer here to start a post-grad fellowship. Uh, so we actually do an 18-month uh, post-grad training of PAs uh, to get them ready to practice at a very highly skilled level in emergency medicine. Right. Um, as you know, finding adequate training can be difficult for all different fields, whether it's mm -hmm. medical students looking for their first residency, nurse practitioners, PAs looking for their, um, you know, student rotations. It's become very difficult because the um, the demands on the clinicians are high. So physicians are asked to work more hours or work, see more patients per shift, all of those things. So finding a spot to squeeze in a student is sometimes difficult. And so as a physician assistant, trying to jump straight out of your two-year um, graduate work to becoming an emergency medicine clinician that functions at a high level, in the years past, you'd get trained really well for months, if not a year. Um, now there isn't time for that. So that's where the fellowship comes in. And so we created that. We have two fellows a year that have been coming um, 
that we, you know, interview and then accept into the program. And then at the end, we feel like we've allowed them to learn enough that they could go and practice uh, with the supervision of a physician um, that they can always consult over the phone or telemedicine um, in these small ERs uh, around the country in these critical access hospitals. Yeah, that's cool. I didn't, I didn't know that you were kind of heading that up. That's, that's a very cool opportunity. Okay, could you tell me your favorite and your least favorite part of your job currently? And your least favorite can't, sure. be, documenting. can't be documenting. Can't be what? Can't be documenting or like all the, oh. all the EMR. <laughs> I don't actually mind that part. I've got all right. Well, it won't it. So, um, so I would say the number one uh, thing that I love about what I do is right now it's teaching. I really like seeing the light bulb go off on a student, resident, fellows, you know, thinking about a patient, um, kind of working with them on their differential. Um, but I really, really like teaching procedures. So. Um, that's the thing that I that got me into emergency medicine and urgent care medicine, um, and I'm always reading about it, trying to figure out how to make my skills better. And so, that would probably be my favorite part right now. Um, I would say my least, maybe the the thing that I don't really like about being a PA, I would say that the only thing that I wish is that PAs were more internationally accepted mm -hmm. um in the international scene medical schools and the training of physicians is so different than it is in the u.s so there hasn't been as much of a need uh you know schools aren't hundreds of thousands of dollars a lot of places it's more paid for through government pr programs mm -hmm. and physicians are able to start their training much earlier uh than you know after they've finished their four-year undergraduate degree and so there hasn't been as much of a need. And I have an interest in uh, working in international populations. Um, I've volunteered in Nicaragua teaching a lot of like suturing labs and um, CPR and all of these fun things. And, and it's been so fun to do those things, but I could never live there and work there um, officially just because I, I they don't know what a physician assistant is because they oh. don't have them in their country. Hmm. Okay. So that's, that's the only that's downside. I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Okay. Last kind of question. Uh, and we're, we're coming towards your hard stop. So, or not a hard, okay. this is more of a soft stop because you said five minutes here there. Yeah. Um, so for any, do you have any advice for the high school student or even undergraduate student that might be watching this that's interested in physician assistant? Um, or maybe medicine in general, you can take either way. Yeah, I mean, I would say that, you know, all of those programs are fairly competitive. And so um, it's always good to be looking for opportunities to differentiate yourself. Um, so obviously academics is a given, um, you know, whether or not that's a good idea always. I think there's great candidates um, that sometimes get missed um, due to a couple bad grades, um, but that is the atmosphere of both med school, PA school uh, that we're in. Um, but I think I would, I would encourage folks to shadow uh, as much as they're able to, um, find contacts in your circle that can get you into places, mm -hmm. find jobs um, that are in the medical field. I really think that's underutilized. Volunteering is great. Sometimes it's hard to find enough volunteer hours or shadowing experiences, but gosh, if you can get your, let's say you're gonna be an EMT, get your EMT certification some summer at a local tech college, ride some ambulance rigs, um, you know, go work as a scribe, you know, things like that. Mm -hmm. And you'll find out so much about the field that you'll be much more confident in your decision of what career path to choose. Um, but also it'll look really good on an application. Mm -hmm. uh, so those are the things I would recommend. And as far as physician assistants, sometimes universities do have pre-PA, pre-med um, societies or clubs. Yep. Uh, being part of that is, is definitely recommended as well. Yeah, it's, it was super helpful for me uh, in undergrad, just being a part of the med club and getting kind of the advice earlier on uh, in my undergrad career um, and just kind of different things to do, kind of like what you were just laying out. Um, 
and I also I was an EMT. I got I did some scribing, so I I checked all the boxes. I guess uh, there you go. Uh, the so are there any? Do you have any other like parting words or anything else you wanted to say um, to the AMP Honors Program? I would just say, um, yeah, the the physician assistant field is uh, still very strong, and I think it is still growing. Um, I don't foresee uh, a time where that is going to slow down in the near future. Um, we have an aging population and there's a need for physicians. There's a need for PAs. There's a need for nurse practitioners. I really like physician assistant uh, as a career path. I really like the hard science that is part of the training of a PA where it is very similarly modeled after um, medical school. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, if you have interest in it, I think you can't go wrong uh, in that field. So yeah, thank, so, thank you. And I, I do want to uh, just emphasize the point you brought up earlier that I didn't, I didn't really um, know about PAs to kind of like you have a little more freedom, it sounds like to kind of move between specialties, I guess, um, that you might not have um, if you were, were to go to medical school and that kind of thing. So that was, that was kind of my that was my biggest um, surprise, I guess, other than the history of PA. I didn't know, I didn't know all the history <laughs> you threw at me. Um, well, thanks so much um, for taking the time before your shift here. Um, and uh, it'll be good to have you on the platform. Great, well, thank you for uh, your time as well and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, you too, good seeing you. Good to see you too. This has been a presentation of the CV Academics Foundation, home of the AMP Honors Program.